hey remember me well i still i'm still here i'm still in this 101 degree apartment here moving in a day or two i thought it'd be a good chance to just do a quick wrap up for the last couple of weeks and um, wrap up for my science fiction reading for the for rocket summer and uh, give an update on my 100 book challenge which is still going pretty well haven't done any videos but i have done a lot of reading and I'm going to talk quick so I can turn the aircon on because it's 101 degrees here. It's been cooler the last few days, but now it's heating up again. Okay, so uh, last time I'd gone as far as Frankenstein, which is the week one prompt for Rocket Summer, which was a book from the 30s or earlier. And then the next was, oh, and I also did for the 40s, I did the C.L. Moore and... and um, and what's her husband's name? I did stories by C.L. Moore and stories by Henry Kuttner. Then for the 50s, I read this early book by uh, Robert Silverberg called Starman's Quest, which apparently Robert Silverberg is not a great fan of. I looked for the article this morning. I couldn't find it, but I read something by him uh, where he wasn't didn't think too much of the book himself. <clears throat> it's his first adult science fiction novel. It's his third published book. He'd written a juvenile, what they call juveniles, which we'd probably call middle grade books today, first. And then he had a second uh, novel uh, come out, which was three stories kind of worked up into a, uh, what they used to call a work up uh, into a novel because they had a similar theme or similar characters. <clears throat> and then this is his first straight novel. I kind of liked it. It's not well written or anything it's a little bit of a shaggy dog story the starman has two quests it's it's set in this world where he's um he's part of a subculture of people who work in space driving transports and stuff they they don't have faster than light travel there they can travel at near light speed so there's time dilation so the people who work in space and travel between different worlds and things uh, mostly just doing transport. There are other civilizations and all that, but they don't have that much contact. Mostly they're doing trade and stuff like that. So they live, you know, they'll be gone on a six-month mission, but nine years will pass on Earth, that kind of thing. So he's got a twin brother. Uh, maybe this is why Robert Silverberg's kind of ashamed of it, because it's kind of uh, like uh, an, an adaption of the old story problem about physics, where you've got one twin, twin who stays on Earth, and another goes up, travels at life speed, and they come out, and then they're years apart in age. So he and his twin brother uh, separate. His twin brother uh, decides to um, jettison the space service. Their, their dad is the captain. It's a family business. He decides to stay on Earth. So six months pass, the the brother who stays with the ship comes back to Earth. He says to look for his brother. Now he knows his brother is going to be about a decade older than him. So his first quest is to find his brother and bring him back to the ship and see what happened to him. And he, and he did not have a good time on Earth. Uh, it was kind of an absurd uh, gambling-based culture that he's a part of where somehow he's a professional gambler even though he constantly loses money. Just goes farther into debt. I really don't know how that economy works. <clears throat> anyway, uh, there's also a backstory about uh, an experimental space drive, a faster than light drive, that people in the space uh, programs are interested in learning about. You know, so they they can uh, have live a normal life and still run their business. Uh, and uh, but the powers of being the governments on Earth and stuff really don't care that much about it because the system's working for them. So the first half is kind of he's looking for his brother. Second half, he's kind of looking for this drive. But I, I thought it was really well done. It was kind of interesting stories and stuff. It's, you know, it's kind of trivial, but I'd recommend it. It's free on, uh, on uh, that free site. Why can't I think of the name of it? Gutenberg. Anyway. So that was that week. Um, then, so that was the 50s. Then the, the week three was supposed to be the 60s. And I read, um, and here's the thing, here's where I kind of part with uh, some opinions uh, that the uh, hosts have had about this Rocket Summer um, <clears throat> challenge or, or event because uh, they seem to feel that the 60s was a big demarcation era in 
science fiction, but I really think it's the late 60s. I think uh, science fiction really changed to new wave, quote unquote, around 67, 68 through 1975. So I would say that's the big change and the stuff before that. Anyway, I didn't have any of those books available uh, in that timeline. I did have one from 1962. Planet of the Damned by Harry Harrison, which is very much a 50s book. That's what I mean about the early 60s being very, just like this, the, the 50s. It's a very much a, a, a 1960s type story. Harry Harrison's an interesting writer, had a very versatile career. He started out, I only learned this year, he started out as a comic book artist for EC Comics. He illustrated and sometimes wrote and co-wrote with Wally Wood. He was part of that circle of of illustrators, science fiction comics for EC Comics in the 50s. Then he started writing novels. He moved to England. I always thought he was English for many, many years until I saw an interview with him somewhere on YouTube a couple of years ago to hear that he has either an American or Canadian accent, probably American. But, um, you know, he wrote all, kind, all kinds of books, different, different styles. He wrote the Stainless Steel Rat series, which is kind of like Space James Bond or well, I guess not James Bond, really, but I always get the Stainless Steel Rat uh, confused with Retief by Keith Lommer, um, who's, I guess, more of a spy. But Stainless Steel Rat kind of gets an in intrigue and stuff like that. He wrote a funny satire called Bill the Galactic Hero. He wrote the book Make Room, Make Room, which was um, the basis of the movie Soylent Green. Uh, and he also wrote, uh, later, later on in his career, he wrote a series of kind of, sort of world-building, uh, you know, big books, um, you know, West of Eden and, and that kind of thing. So he had a very versatile uh, writer. I've liked him before. I like his, I thought this Planet of the Damned, I thought this was part of the Death World, World Trilogy. I've read Death World 1 and 2 in the past, uh, which are great. It's so about exploring this really, really hostile world, and I thought this was uh, a similar kind of thing. It's, it's not quite, it's more of an anti-nuke story. It starts off with uh, a guy on a planet who they have to play this game, this game to get ahead and, and win, and he sort of, um, Uh, takes his winnings and, and his his success in in that in that game. I forget what it was called. It had a good name though. It was kind of a Hunger Games kind of thing, and trying to use it to his influence to rid the world of nuclear war. But you know it, it's okay. I've read better stuff by Harry Harrison. Then where in the world's my next one? I read, and this is odd, kind of, that this was next that I read. This is another games-based. This is long, long before Lit RPG, of course, but this is a book called, by Barry Malzberg called The Gamesman, which I had a copy of for many years. I don't think I ever read it, though, and this is also a game book. It's interesting. Uh, I mean, a, a guy who has to participate in a game, the whole, whole world is game is based and he's a games kind of a person who runs your game and tells you whether you're winning or not and it's very mal mal malls bergian and if there's a lot of sex it's 1975 and, and uh, this is kind of what i'm talking about the difference between the early 60s all the way up into the 70s this is a book that would not be written this way today it's very experimental. It's got uh, graphic sex, or I guess these days it's really kind of rare to have any kind of sex in a book that uh, the Gen Z might read and upset them. Um, but he's kind of inept at sex, and so his game is to try and uh, satisfy a woman. is very, very absurd and very abstract, and people's roles change a lot. Very, very stream of consciousness and sur surrealist like a lot of Malzberg's books are and is quite a contrast between the games played in, in Planet of the Damned which was only written I said 64 but it might have been 62 so this is 13 years later it's like a whole different field by the, by the mid 70s and it is again today of course 
That was, oh, I read a, I'm reading a couple of short story books too that I'm part way through. Oh, I thought I, I, I didn't download all the covers. This one I've had for a while. This is Brad Brewster's. This is magnificent. Um, hundred story collection that I've had. I think it was one of the first books I, I think I bought uh, on my Kindle years ago when I first got the app. I got my first Kindle because it was, you know, it's such a big book. It's uh, almost a thousand pages, I think, maybe 900 pages, a hundred stories. I, I've dipped into it from time to time. But for some reason, even though it's slowing me down on my 100 book challenge, I felt like I really wanted to read it straight through. So I started at the beginning. I'm not completely through it yet, but I will be soon. Um, you know, three or four stories a day. Just pick one up whenever. You know, they're usually pretty short. He's magnificent. I don't need to tell people about Ray Bradbury, I don't think, but it's great to see them. And I'm also surprised at how many of these stories I had not read before, because I've read many of his collections that came out over the years, but there's just so many more. And I think in the, I have to look in the anthology, the introduction again, but I think he has said he'd published over 800 stories. I could have that confused with the page count of the book, though. This is 100 stories, quite a bit of story. I'd say there's 75% great. There's a couple that are a bit too silly and sentimental. Um, but, you know, he's so readable. He's so easy to read. His style is so clear and <clears throat> unpretentious and uh, straightforward and uh, lots of value. So his stories are easy to read any time of the day or night if you're tired or whatever's going on. So I really love getting reacquainted with Bradbury. I'm also, I've got a book called The Philip K. Dick Collection, which is just some small publisher taking all the public domain stories available on Gutenberg of Philip K. Dick and putting them together in, into a 13-story collection. I forgot to download a cover to show you, but you know, they're, they're widely available. Uh, I've got a couple left to read in that, but I've read most of that collection too. I'm kind of bouncing back and forth between the collections. Uh, the first story, Yonder Lies the Wub, which is a very disturbing story. I'm I'm a meat eater, I'm not a vegetarian in any sense, or a vegan in any sense, and I never will be, but, you know, but sort of like Yonder Lies the Web really does, uh, really does bring in the, the moral, uh, the moral, uh, contradictions of, of eating other animals to survive. A uh, very powerful story, uh, rather cruel, which is a hallmark of, of Philip K. Dick's stories. There's often a lot of people with, you know, people know this from Blade Runner and everything. There's a lot of sociopathic behavior. There's a lot of non-empathetic characters. A, lot, a lack of empathy is something I think that Philip K. Dick was really concerned about in his writing more than what's human or not. It's really like what's empathy and what isn't. And so he even had that in his earliest stories. And these stories are basically from the 50s, I think. That's it for science fiction, except for Star Trek, of course. Still doing a Summer of Trek, Wrath of the Summer of Trek. Uh, this was the last <coughs> book I think I'll be reading on that. I found a couple more under. on. Kindle Unlimited that I might read that I've picked out to read, but this would be the last one that counts on my towards my hundred book challenge because this is one that I had on hold from the library for a while. Star Trek Titan Taking Wing. This is the first book in a ten book series about taking place after the last Next Generation movie, where uh, Riker goes uh, leaves at the end of that movie. That really. One of the worst Star Trek movies. I forget the name of it even. It's Star Trek. Uh, it's not Insurrection, but it's the one after the very last one. At the end of it, uh, Riker leaves the Enterprise and goes to take command of his own ship, the Titan. And I liked it. I liked it a lot. I think it's one of the best, <clears throat> most enjoyable Star Trek books I've read, and I haven't been very happy with them for the most part. I, I think. And it's got characters from different series. I think this is a thing <clears throat> that might 
uh, that might make the next generation and books that are written later, books in the 90s and early 2000s, uh, more interesting because they have such a large cast to draw on. Like Spock is in this book because it involves uh, going to Romulus um, and Spock is there, you know, in kind of a sequel to the Next Generation episode he was on where he's trying to reunify Romulus uh, the Romulan Empire and Vulcan, so he's there. The character Tuvok from from uh, Voyager is there. This is the timeline it's in. It's about right after Voyager returns at the end of that series, and you know, there's also a lot of characters that I had to go look up because uh, I didn't know if they were just uh, series characters that I missed. Or there's a character who plays his. Riker's second in command, who's a character who's been in other novels by other authors. Uh, this one's co authored by Martin and Mangles. Um, and <clears throat> her, she has never been in the series, but she's been in other books. So there's characters who become popular just out of the books. So there's a bigger world they could play with and they could put different characters together. Like there's one I've got from that's on uh, Kindle Unlimited I haven't read yet but I did download it where it's a 7 of 9 from Voyager goes back in time and, and you know meets Captain Kirk and there's there's that kind of stuff they can do with, more with the characters whereas frankly the earlier novels I've read the, the ones based on the original series are very plot driven um, I don't know if that was a, a, a instruction of those early days like don't change the characters don't don't fill out their past lives or anything just put them on adventures I don't know but I mean I know these stories quote unquote don't count because of uh, you know they keep making new movies and new series and stuff but I thought it was a good story it's mostly a political this Titan novel was a mostly a political intrigue they're trying to you know um, Riker's trying to get his crew together but they're also on a secret mission to uh, rescue Spock and Try and avert um, some calamities with the Romulans, that kind of stuff. You know, there's a space battle or two, but it's mostly politics, and I I really enjoyed it. I thought it was not bad. I'm gonna read the others in that series. I always like Riker. I don't know why, but um, I, I, over the years when I rewatch those episodes, I, I really do think he's one of the uh, most fun characters for me to read about. So that's for science fiction. I also read, I think I mentioned my last video, I just started to handle the Baskervilles. I read um, that again, and I wanted more Sherlock Holmes after that, so I read my second favorite Sherlock Holmes novel, The Study in Scarlet. You know, those are both very short. And those are the two I like. The other two, there's four novels and 56 stories. The other two novels, The Valley of Fear and The Sign of Four, or the sign of the four. I think it's appeared both ways. Um, I don't even remember. I never do. And I've read them a couple of times and they just go right out of my head. They're just not very interesting stories to me. Uh, so I will probably not read any more of these. Um, I probably won't read those two again. I might read, I might take on after I finish all these Philip K. Dick and Bradbury series, I might uh, read the memoirs of Sherlock Holmes. I just read the adventures of Sherlock Holmes last month. So uh, I'm always reading Sherlock Holmes, it looks like. Then uh, I said I was going to start Pride and Prejudice. I still haven't started it, though. That is next, after, between Bradbury stories and Dick stories. Um, the next novel I'm going to start will be Pride and Prejudice. Uh, that brings me up, not counting Pride and Prejudice, that brings me up to 79 books. So I guess I'm going to make it. <clears throat> I have to read 21 more. I have at least 14, 15. I have a list of 16 books. I don't know if I'll get to them all for Garb August, um, which I'll talk about next time, but I've already got those lined up. And, and oh, it might even be more. 14, 15, and 5, 25. Oh, that'll probably do it. Um, they're short, you know, trashy paperbacks, uh, be fun to talk about, so I don't know how many videos I'll do next month, probably a little bit better, 
uh, have more of a better setup in my other place, I think. We'll find out in a day or two. I hope you're all well, and we'll talk soon.